Uh, good morning, everybody. Today is Monday, December 5th, and we are continuing through our uh, work with combined loads and proceeding through more circle. Uh, if you look at our Moodle page, you'll see that I posted the vodcast for the beginning of the combined loads uh, lecture. Today, December 5th, and Wednesday, December 7th, uh, I will also post vodcasts, and on Friday, we will meet face-to-face -to, -face to discuss the remainder of the material for the class uh, to get through the final exam. So, having said that, I have zero pieces of paper. Does anyone have a piece of paper I can borrow? Just like, if you got something out, just a couple pieces, and I'll get a card with you. Thank you, sir. That would be great. All right, that way I can take some put some notes up on the board. So, um, today, I'm going to go ahead and come back over here, change my presentation to the document cam, and there we go. Um, Monday, December 5th, uh, we'll do a vodcast continuing in the material for Chapter 16. And on Wednesday, December 7th, We'll also do a vodcast. Uh, I will be off campus that day, so I will attempt to do the vodcast tomorrow, and then, or maybe possibly later this afternoon, but I'll have the vodcast posted for you. And then Friday, December 9th, is our last day of class. And, um, one of the things we will do then is review for the final. And our final exam is scheduled for Monday, December 12th. It will be in this room and it will be held from 3.30 <coughs> till 5.30 or 5.20 p.m. All right, so that's what we have for the rest of the semester. So that's a pretty good deal. All right, so um, on our Moodle page, uh, you'll see right here is the uh, link for the notes for the combined loads at Moore Circle. And I began talking about this last Friday, but your assignment is to read through this material and to recognize basically that we have uh, four important formulas. One is for that sigma average due to a, uh, a load of tension or compression to an axial load. Sigma is equal to P over A. Uh, tau shearing stress from torsion is equal to TC over J. And then the other two formulas that we have have to do with bending and shear where sigma uh, is equal to a moment times C over I, and tau from a shearing force is equal to VQ over IT. All right, so the important thing to know about this is that these formulas, we discussed this on Monday in the vodcast, but basically these are additive. We can use what is called the principle of superposition to add these together as long as we know the direction. So in other words, if we have a sigma, if we have a, 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 an axial load that pulls our structural member into tension, and we have a bending moment that puts everything, if it's a positive bending moment, everything above the neutral axis would be in compression, everything below the neutral axis would be in tension, that means that the absolute value of these two would add below the neutral axis on a cross section, and the absolute values of these would subtract, or it would be the difference uh, be above the neutral axis. Similarly, with, tension, with torsion and uh, the shearing stress from a, from a transverse force, V. However, the direction is a little bit squiffier, and there's sort of this um, icon that you can use now and in the future. Uh, to determine what sort of loads create or have a positive sign associated with them. Basically, if you have a structural item that you have cut 
on the right hand side P M and V these are the positive uh, loading conditions if we've cut on this direction and if we cut the other way we have P M and V all right so in each case you can use these little icons or these little um, summarizing diagrams to keep your sign convention straight all right so as we discussed in the vodcast on um, on Monday or on Friday uh, the steps used to separate combined loads the first and most important thing is to draw a free body diagram and solve for those external reactions. Uh, redraw the free body diagrams with the external loads applied. Cut the body at a point of interest and draw a free body diagram on the cut. All of this is stuff we've already done. Is it kind of strange to think that everything we've learned in this class can be summarized in four formulas and eight instruction steps? Pretty cool, huh? But now you know what we're talking about. If I would have brought this up on the first day, you probably well, I don't know. I was going to say you might have decided to hate me, but I don't know if those two things are coincident or not. So anyway, we calculate the normal and shearing stress for each load type, and then we use the principle of superposition to determine what they are. So we find that sigma total is equal to the axial sigma plus the bending sigma, and the tau total is equal to the torsional tau plus the bending tau. Now, the thing that we need to remember here when we talk about bending tau I'm going to flip back over here to the document cam. Is that this formula actually it has something to do with this idea. When we have a vertically applied load, V, or a transverse load, um, when we studied pure bending in chapter four, we did not talk about transverse loads. We talked about bending moments that produced only normal stress because of this particular configuration. Uh, but if we have something like this, we are going to also induce that shearing stress because the plates of the structural member are going to slide against each other. And so we have that horizontally induced stress um, or shear flow uh, created by that vertical um, by that vertical applied load. And that's where we came up with the origins of this equation. So we have to take all of that into consideration. The reason I pointed out was just because the author of this document refers to that as tau from bending. And we use bending in a slightly different, uh, a slightly different manner. We used it to just talk about pure bending moments. But we're talking about those loads that create bending and shear when uh, Mr. Bailey put this document together. All right, so in uh, the first vodcast, I went through example one, so I'm not going to go through it again, but there are a couple of little points I want to make, is since we know that uh, P over A is consistent across the structural member, but MC over I depends on where you are on the structural member longitudinally and also on the face, the cross-sectional face. So we could have a different uh, sigma from bending at point A than point B, and also tau being VQ over IT is going to be different at every single point. So A, for example, uh, is above the neutral axis. And if we have a bending moment, it's either going to be positive or negative, depending on whether that moment is positive or negative. B, on the other hand, uh, we're going to have a maximum bending moment at the bottom. But our tau at the bottom is equal to 0, tau from bending because it's VQ over IT and Q at this point, there's no area below point B away from the neutral axis. So Q is equal to zero and therefore tau due to bending or due to V is equal to zero, All right? So we went through this and this is just a really good example uh, when you're doing your homework of how to uh, go through this process. Now, the last little point, and we did talk about this on the vodcast on Monday, or on Friday rather, uh, but you need to do what's called a stress block at point A, uh, which is just a little minute, not infinitely small, but a little finite block at point A that starts from the cut face 
and goes a small undefined amount into the structural member. So we have to talk about what our tau is on that stress block and what our sigma is on that point as well. The thing I'd like to point out is that you always want to identify which one of these is your cut face. You could put the cut face here or you could put the cut face here. In either case, your sigma is going to be the same, but depending on which way you draw your stress block, your tau arrows may be this way. In other words, the vertical arrows may rotate you counterclockwise and the horizontal area, arrows ro rotate clockwise, or it could be the opposite way around. So you just have to identify where you're cutting. All right. So in this particular problem, they do um, a stress block at A and a stress block at B. And as you can see at B, all we have is a sigma. We do not have a tau because B is at the bottom of that cross section. So B equal VQ over IT, Q is equal to zero, therefore tau is equal to zero. And as you run through this analysis, you'll see um, exactly what that looks like. So let's take a look at a different, um, a different type of a problem. It's the same idea. We're going to use a superposition. We're going to do some stress blocks. And we're going, only this time we have both a torsional load. We have a 1,200 Newton meter torsion on, that's shown on the end of this. And from this point of view, it's uh, counterclockwise. And then we also have a transverse force of 3,000 newtons. So that means that at points C and B, we have the possibility of having two different types of taus. In other words, we have a tau from a V, and we have a tau from a T. Now, we also could have a sigma. We do not have a, an axial load here. But we have a sigma because this 3,000 Newton force is going to result on a moment on that cut face. So you're going to have a sigma that results from MC over I or MY over I, right? So when we do example 16.2, we keep all of those ideas in mind, all right? So it says that there are uh, three stress blocks, A, B, and C. And on this diagram, we don't really see A but it's actually on the other side. We're talking about doing a cut two meters back from the end where this is applied and where this is applied. And so then we're looking at these points on the perimeter. So you can see them a little bit more clearly here. All right. Now, what they've done is they've sort of rotated this. You see from this point of view, go away. Okay, hang on. Okay, from this point of view, uh, this torque is the opposite of this torque. And that's because we've sort of, we've spun this back into the wall. So we're looking at the cut face. In other words, this point, the end over here that was, is back into the picture is this end, isn't it? And what we're doing is we're cutting two meters in front of it or two meters closer to the wall, which is right here. So we spun this around so that we can see point A, B, and C. And you also see his orientation axes are a little bit different. He uses Y uh, in this direction, X up and Z out of the page. All right, but that's not really, I mean, as long as we know that we're talking about perpendiculars, it's okay. So we've got, we need to have this three-dimensional axis system so that we are able to uh, analyze these things. So the first thing we do, we've drawn our free body, we're starting to draw our free body diagram. We do summation of forces. We recognize that we do not have a P, we do not have an axial load at all. We know that we have a V, and we also know that we have a moment. Now, it's important to do the free body diagram in that we have, <coughs> dang it, I wish I would quit doing that. Um, we have a 3,000 Newton force here, and moment is equal to force times distance. So the moment is going to be different the farther we get from the application of that force, isn't it? So we need to keep that in mind. We need to do that free body diagram in order to find what M is. All right, so we do this. We do our summation force, find our P, find our responsive V, find our moment on the cut, and then we also we already know what the torque is, but we can do the summation of the torques, and we get a 1,200 newton meter torque, which is the same magnitude as the applied torque. All right, so um, 
So this is just an idea of the free body diagrams for the forces, and this is the, the force in the moment, and this is a free body diagram for the torque. There's another important thing to remember is that whenever we use a torque, the only thing we've ever broken down the equations for are circles or semicircles. We need to have, or circles or hollowed out circles with like a circle with an annular space. We really do not have the math to do a prismatic member. So anytime that you have a torque, we're going to have to be working with a prismatic, we're going to have to be working with a circle or, or a hollowed out circle because we've never really investigated that math. If you end up getting to the point where you are putting a torque on a prismatic member, you'll have to do the math at that point, which you may in mechanics materials too, but usually you get into modeling instead of doing this kind of math. All right, so we calculate the normal stress due to bending, which is MC over I. Now, here are some points to remember. C is how far you are from the neutral axis. It would actually be Y, it would be the old nomenclature. So MY over I, how far you are from the neutral axis. Well, point B, is on the neutral axis. If we go back to our original diagram, right here, A and B are on the neutral axis, aren't they? So there's no bending moment stress sigma on A or B because Y is equal to zero. At C, we're going to be at the top, so there is going to be a bending moment uh, or stress from the bending moment. You can see since the bending moment looks like this, that it's going to be a tension, isn't it? So it's just kind of a good idea to analyze that and think about all that stuff at that point. All right, so getting back to the analysis then, we have tau is equal to VQ over IT. Calculate Q, um, if we're at the axis once again, we have Q for a semicircle, which this would be area times Y, and these are given in the back of your book. So you can calculate that, that Q value. Once again, now what about for point A? Point A is at the top, or go back here and take a look. Point C, rather, is at the top. There's no Q for point C, is there? So tau due to um, VQ over IT at point C is going to be equal to zero. So what I'm saying is we have three different points. We're going to have to figure out all four of these, these numbers differently at each point. Okay? All right. All right, so we have Q, we can find I for a circle, so then we can, found tau, we can find tau, and then we do shearing stress due to torsion, TC over J, and we have our value, all right? Then there's just a little bit of um, talk about when we find that we want to draw these three stress blocks at A, B, and C. We want to make sure that we identify the cut face and what's going on at the cut face at each of those points, okay? So here they are. Here's point A. We have a bending moment not really a bending moment, excuse me, a bending force of V that creates a shearing stress. Now shearing stress, if you think about it, here's my cut face. So this arrow corresponds to the direction of the reaction of the shearing stress. If this is pointing up, the other side of the stress block has to be down or else the block is going to move. So in order to prevent the block from moving, it has to stabilize in that way. But if you just have those two arrows, tau is a planar force means that acts on the entire plane. So you can think about that, even though this balances the forces and the summation of forces in the vertical direction equals zero, we'll have a rotation. This would actually rotate. Um, so in order to counteract that, we have to draw arrows on the horizontal faces that produce the opposite rotation. The four arrows together are the representation of the shearing stress at that point, okay? The shearing stress from VQ over IT. Uh, torsion. Same thing, we have, this, uh, we have this cut face. We see that the arrows on that cut face are opposite. So what does that mean? Well, it means that uh, this number, 0 0.309 MPA, is this number minus this number. Because in other words, this one's going up, this one's going down. So the net uh, tau is going down on the cut face. This should be labeled cut face, by the way. Uh, and the magnitude is this minus this. Okay. Now, just going back to this one more time, when you look at point A, you can see that the bending, that the torsion is going to have two components at that point. The torsion, MC over I, there is no... Um, 
Hold it a second. Okay, there's no p. This is just the, the this is just a variable, but there's no uh, axial load. So that means that all of normal stress is going to come from that bending moment. Bending moment is my over i, so a and b have no sigma whatsoever. It's all tau. Okay. So just emphasizing then, since we figured out tau on point A, and we know that there's no sigma, this is a complete stress block for point A. For point B, we're going to have different magnitudes. We have the same numbers, but look what happens when you do the cut face. Both the V tau and the T tau are pointing down. So at this point, the combined magnitude of tau at point B is added instead of subtracted. So instead of being 0.39 minus 0.081, it's 0.39 plus 0.081 at point B. And you can see that by the rotation. This pushes it up, this pushes it up. So the response is down and down. Okay? So this is the new piece, is that we need to think about the direction of tau even though it's on a plane. Okay, is it up or is it down? And at this point, those are all the questions we're going to answer. We're not going to answer over. There's not going to be a sum of over. Because what happens here at point C? Well, we have a tau, but we do not have a VQ over IT because Q is zero. So in other words, you're not add, you're adding something to zero. So the direction does not the direction is not important unless you know whether you need to add or subtract it. And since it's on a plane, it gets a little strange at the at those other points that aren't uh, parallel to each other. All right, well now we go back to point C, and what we find at point C is we have a MC over I value of 3.9 from the bending moment, and then we have torsion only. We have no VQ over IT, so our combined stress block looks like this. All right, so in other words, this is the magnitude that is written incorrectly right here. See that? It says 7.9. The value is 3.9. So when you have your notes, you'll just notice there's, this is just 3.9. But the process is correct. Okay? And these three things together are your answers uh, to the problems. <laughs> All right. So <clears throat> if you have, um, and I'll just go through this a little bit really quickly, but basically here we have a torque. We have an axial load, which is going to put this whole thing into compression. And we also have a force applied here. If we cut back, depending on where we cut, it looks like this whole thing is five feet long. We cut back one foot from this applied force, two feet from the wall. We're also going to have a bending moment. So this is really as complicated as you can get. There's four different parts of the formula. And when we take a look at these different points, A, B, and C, uh, once again, for point C and point B, the VQ over IT portion of tau is zero because there's no Q. Q is equal to zero for C. Q is equal to zero for B. Q will be that Q for a half circle at point A. Okay, so you do your statics. You get your P and your V and your M and your T. And then you calculate P over A and MC over I for sigma. And you calculate VQ over IT and TC over J, which should be right here. Okay, and then you look at what the differences are at those four points. You add them together. There's a diagram of point A. There are three different um, parts. Add them together vectorally. Point B, add them together vectorally. And point C, add them together vectorally. So the big point that I would like to make here is that these are your answers. These stress blocks are your answers to the problem. So when you take your test, when you do your homework, uh, this is what it should look like. All right. Now, the next thing that we're going to get into is called Moore's Circle. And I'm going to talk about this in just a minute. Uh, but what I want to do first is to just zip ahead to the end of the chapter. And what I assigned on Friday was 16.1 and 16.2. So what I'm going to assign for today is 
16.4, 16.5, and this is an interesting one, and 16.6. .6. So I'm going to put this up on the document cam. Uh, Friday, which was the second, do 16.1 and 16.2. Wednesday, the fourth, do 16.3 through 16.6. All right, what this means is that we have two more topics, and I'm going to start covering one of them today just to give you an introduction, and then, um, and then the last one is actually really simple. We've already covered it. It's about factors of safety, but it's just choosing materials that are appropriate for, um, for a, doing a particular job with a particular uh, safety factor. Okay. Here's the point of th this next this next topic that we're going to cover, and I'm not going to sign any homework for this today, but I'm going to talk about it briefly today on this podcast, and then on the Wednesday podcast, I'm going to go through and do a problem or two showing you how to use this. But we have a technique called Moore's Circle, and the gentleman who came up with this idea was a German mathematician whose name was Otto Moore, and he realized something very interesting. And for those of you who are very mathematically oriented, I have the derivation of this, but engineering texts usually do not present the absolute um, derivation. But I do have it if you're interested. But I would say this is one of the reasons um, that makes me realize that mathematicians um, are basically engineer's best friend, because the way that this works is that if you have this information uh, available to you, that you are absolutely set to organize all of this information in a single graphical diagram that would take you tables and tables and tables of information uh, to put down and to understand what's going to happen. But basically, what Otto Moore came up with was um, sigma and tau are not independent. Um, they are dependent on each other as functions of location, and that's an XYZ location and an angle. So basically, if we go back here to this stress block, and we recognize that if we have a stress block at a particular point, just like we've just drawn A, B, or C, if we actually take that stress block and we rotate that stress block through 180 degrees, it will come back and be an exact replica of itself. In other words, we have symmetry at 180 degrees. And what we find is, is that sigma and tau will vary in relationship to each other as we rotate through the stress block. If you recall back when we were talking about biaxial loads or if we were talking about oblique surfaces with an axial load and we looked at the slope of a glued surface, we recognized that if we had an axial load that tau max occurred at an angle of 45 degrees. What that means is, is that sigma max and tau max are 45 degrees off of each other. So in other words, if you know the location of sigma max, 45 degrees off of that in one direction or that is going to be tau max. And the punchline of this is that every single time, we don't really care what the stress at a given point is. What we care is the maximum stress because we always have to design for maximum, maximum, maximum. Because if your structural member fails anywhere, 
it fails. So that's the deal. So the question is, how do we look at an entire structural member through every single rotation, at every single orientation, and every single point, and decide where sigma max and tau max occur? We can do that. We have all the techniques. We could do tables, and we could do calculations, we could get out of Excel, or we can use Otto Moore's technique of a circle, which is where he recognized, for reasons known only to applied mathematicians, that I have to put up this first, sorry. Moore recognized that sigma and tau are cyclic functions and if we draw them on a circle two degrees on the circle because the circle is 360 degrees is equivalent to or equals I guess I could say one degree on a stress block because we have symmetry at 180 degrees on a stress block and since we know that any circle has a given radius and a given center if we could determine the center of that circle and the radius of that circle and if we consider this axis to be sigma and we know that tau max is 45 degrees in real life off of the circle, excuse me, off of sigma, that it must be 90 degrees on the circle if 2 degrees equals 1 degree. We could draw a circle, not in x and y, but in sigma and tau, and determine when those maximum values occur. So if we could take the center of the circle, x comma y, and we could add to that the radius, we could find sigma max, and we can also find sigma min. And these two are called the principal stresses. So we can find out what they are, and we can find what rotation they occur at. And we can also find tau max is at 45 degrees in real life, 90 degrees on the circle, from sigma max and sigma min. Now, <clears throat> going back to this idea, if we just had a single axial load like this, we know that sigma max is going to occur when we have an orientation like that. And sigma min is going to have, it's going to have a value of zero, but it's going to be a maximum when we have an orientation like that. So in real life, this is 90 degrees. Means on the circle, it's 180 degrees. We also know that if we have a slope, glued surface, sigma, tau, 90 degrees apart, 45 degrees apart, 90 degrees apart, 180 degrees apart. So isn't that spectacular? There you go. So we also know from our equations because we have a sine theta cosine theta function times p over a or a squared, I think it's like this, um, that this maximizes at 45 degrees. So 45 there is 90 here. So the upshot of this is, and this is where I'm going to leave you today before we, I'll broadcast, I'll broadcast again for Wednesday, therefore, if we know the radius and center of Moore's circle, we have all the information we need for an analysis. So on Wednesday, I'm going to come back and I'm going to show you the exact specifics of drawing 
Moore circle based on limited data using the idea of a circle and the geometry of a circle to expand into a very general uh, solution technique. That's very, very powerful. So we'll start where we left off with the stress blocks and we will continue with drawing more circle on Wednesday. All right, that's it for today. Thank you for your attention and we'll see you Wednesday. Although I will not be here Wednesday, but I will vodcast and I'll hope to vodcast tomorrow so that it will be available to you by Wednesday. And that will be our very last lecture of the semester, except for Friday when we review for the final.